Women's hoops, no one is hotter than Michigan right now. The Wolverines atop the Big Ten after winning seven straight, including double-digit margins over Ohio State and Indiana in their last two games. That was the Hoosiers' first loss of the year in conference play coming off of their COVID pause. You see them at 7-1. to Iowa has been great as well, winning eight of its last nine. They just obliterated Wisconsin last night. We'll get to all that with Megan McEwen, who is here to talk things over, get us caught up on what's going on in women's hoops. And to me, Michigan has been the biggest story. Is this a legitimate Final Four contender in your eyes? At this point in time, they just might be. And I think a lot of things need to continue to go right for Michigan in order for that to be the case. But right now, they are certainly a top eight seed regarding that one or two seed in the NCAA tournament right now. And it's because they are playing so well as a complete team. Nas Hillman, the reigning Big Ten Player of the Year, continues to be dominant on the interior. But it's also other post players like Emily Kaiser, who is an excellent peanut butter jelly combination down in the paint for Michigan. And then a player like Gardner. Maddie Nolan, who's knocking down threes at a high clip. Not to mention, guard Leah Brown, who has just done a little bit of everything for this team. Plus, Michigan is just rebounding the absolute everything out of the ball right now. They <laughs> out-rebounded <laughs> Indiana 52-20 to 20 in that last game. So the rebounding margin has been excellent, grabbing the boards. Michigan's just a force to be reckoned with in the paint. Yeah, they're fabulous. So you think about the job. There have been some incredible coaching jobs in this league. I mean, Terry Morin taking over Indiana, a team that's really had no historical success and she's got them you know had them an eyelash away from the final four last year but you think about Kim Barnes Rico taking over Michigan they'd won two NCAA tournament games ever they make the sweet 16 last year for the first time and now we're talking about them as as potential final four it, it's it's pretty remarkable and they're six and one against ranked opponents they're building a really good resume as you know too in this time of year, right, it's the dog days of the season. Everybody's really tired in February. The season, you can't quite see the end yet, but you're in the middle of a tough conference schedule, and you have to peak at the right time as a team. This Michigan team is starting to peak. I'm curious to see how consistently that peak is going to last. Can they carry all this momentum over into the Big Ten tournament in March? I got a huge game coming up Sunday against Iowa. We'll talk about the Hawkeyes in a minute, but I do want to talk about Indiana, who Michigan, as you said, I mean, thoroughly dominated the glass on them. We know the story with Indiana. They do not have Mackenzie Holmes right now. She had knee surgery. She's such a huge part of what they do, particularly inside. They needed a huge rally to beat Minnesota yesterday. They went on a 14-0 run at the end of the game to win it by 10. What do you think of what's going on with the Hoosiers? The biggest knock on Indiana has always been they don't necessarily have a ton of depth, and that's just because Terry Morin doesn't really play a ton of her bench. So having Mackenzie Holmes out, who was not only the team's leading scorer but the best rebounder as well, has obviously hurt them. That being said, there's still a lot of talent on the floor for this IU team. The issue with the Hoosiers is every single player that averages double figures, which is four of their five starters, can't not average have a double figure game. Everybody has to step up and do just what they're expected and even a little more in order for Indiana to stay just as dominant as they have been in the past. Yeah, as you said, I mean, they got 31 minutes off of their bench yesterday. 31 total minutes from bench players. I mean, that's that's hard to... Again, look, I understand it's not necessarily by design, right? I mean, if you had Mackenzie Holmes, it, it would be different, but... I mean, how sustainable do you believe that is? It's going to be hard to sustain, especially as they get into the gauntlet of the Big Ten. And Indiana still has a tough schedule ahead. They had to miss about two weeks because of a COVID pause and then other teams having COVID pauses. So they still have to play Iowa again. They have to play Maryland. They have to play Michigan State, who's really good and took Maryland down to the wire last night. So they still have a tough schedule ahead. I'm curious to see how this team comes together, but never count the Hoosiers out because they are so disciplined. And Terry Morin is one of the best coaches in the country when it comes to scout specific gaming and we always talk about defense travels right always and if you are a defensive oriented tough-minded team you're going to win a lot of games and and that is what they are uh, iowa obliterated wisconsin last night uh, caitlin clark was just unbelievable uh, another triple double for her i i really feel like sometimes we just kind of run out of superlatives <laughs> in talking about her right? i mean she's just that you good what a thesaurus or something just yeah, yeah, right, no, yeah. I, uh, my vocabulary is too limited to talk <laughs> about caitlin clark but so what do you think about this matchup iowa michigan i mean these are the two hottest teams in the league, you maybe could make an argument they're the two best teams right in the now league. for sure. Yeah, so what Playing do you think? Playing the best right now, I would definitely think that's fair to say. I'm curious to watch the battle on the interior in this game. Forward Nas Hillman for Michigan going against forward Monica Sinano for Iowa. 
Both are excellent from a field goal percentage standpoint. Both have excellent motors when it comes to rebounding the ball. So this is going to come down to rebounding for sure. And I'm curious to see how Michigan is successful in slowing Iowa down. The Hawkeyes are a team that love to push the pace. And when you have a player like Caitlin Clark, who's the Oscar Robertson practically of women's college basketball, (laughs) then you have a good chance of winning a lot of games. Yeah, she is. uh, She is a walking triple double. And now six triple doubles in her career after the one last night I that mean, ties come on. Samantha Logic for the most in Big Ten history. And yeah, Oscar Robertson, of course, averaged a, a triple double famously. But but it does feel like, right, it's Iowa's offense. They're, they're tops in the Big Ten in scoring. Michigan's defense, tops in the Big Ten in scoring D. Is it as simple as that? I mean, as you said, there's it's not like Michigan can't score, right? I mean, they no, got, Michigan, you got the reigning Big Ten player of the year in Nas Hillman. I, right. They're really good. And not to mention, I don't think we give Leah Brown enough credit for Michigan, who's one of their guards forwards, who's just been excellent from the mid-range game and just does a little bit of everything for that team. This game is going to come down to a battle on the inside. Can both teams stay out of foul trouble because, look, Nas Hillman has gotten into foul trouble this year. Monica Sinano has gotten into foul trouble this year for Iowa. So I'm curious how it's going to be officiated from that standpoint. How physical can these women get down in the paint? Iowa shooting nearly 53% in conference play. That number just jumped out of me it's when crazy. I was looking And they through. hadn't been shooting well earlier in the season, <laughs> right. and now they're shooting about 34% from three, too. I mean, they've been just on fire lately. What's going on with Maryland? Uh, you mentioned they, they beat Michigan State mm-hmm. on the road. They had a really tough – they were in a tough spot. They had to travel on the day of the game, yeah. right, because of the storm. So you don't normally see that. Then Ashley Owosu got hurt mm-hmm. in the game. Mm-hmm. So that's a huge blow, right? I mean, she's one of the best players in the league. So, like, let's give them a lot of credit. And they've won four straight games. And I get all that. And they've had a ton of injuries. I mean, is it just as simple as – They've had a lot of injuries this year, and they've had a lot of adversity. Uh, again, they're still a top-20 team, but but I think we came into this year and thought that, well, you get me the first week of February, and the team we'll be talking about with Final Four potential is, sure. is Maryland, and I don't think we are right now. I mentioned this to you last week. When we think about Maryland, it's similar to Alabama football, where yeah. they lose one game, you're like, oh, my goodness, what's happening? Yeah. Because yeah, they've yeah. been so dominant since entering the league in 2015. This Maryland team, though, is going to be just fine, in my opinion. They are still a Sweet 16 Elite Eight team, and they have simply dealt with injuries throughout this year, not to mention an incredibly tough non-conference schedule. Maryland played the number one, number two, and number three ranked teams in the country back earlier in the season, and that was without star forward Diamond Miller. So they have had a lot of players in and out of the lineups due to injury. Ashley Owusu, the point guard, went out last night with an injury. No word on how long she's going to be out. But when you have so many people in and out of the lineup, you don't have as much time on the floor to develop that chemistry. Why Maryland was so good a year ago is because they're starting five was the starting five the whole season, and everybody knew exactly what they were going to do and what their roles were on that team. This year, players have been in and out a little more, but I think Maryland's really starting to find a rhythm. And as you know, you want to peak at the end of February, beginning of March. It doesn't necessarily matter if you're peaking in January. You want to peak in March. No, I'm with you, and I think the Alabama football is a good comparison. We talk about this a lot on the Big Ten football side. You know, Ohio State, like the bar's Same different. Thing. The bar's different with different. Ohio State, right? Like they measure their program in terms of are we good enough to win a national championship? That's their measurement. Mm-hmm. And so we look at them through that same lens. And I think we look at Maryland the same way, maybe not necessarily a national championship, although they've won one, but more so the Big Ten champs. Like oh, you yeah. kind of go in and the default setting with them is they're going to win the Big Ten. And as of right now, it doesn't look like they're going to win the Big Ten. So so I, I think your, your point is a really good one. Where are we in terms of bracketology? The, the NCAA... Put your bracketology hats yeah, on yes, now. The NCAA it's that time of year. Had its reveal this mm-hmm. week. We had two Big Ten teams in the top 16. Uh, where do you think the, the Big Ten... Here we are with, uh, with Indiana and Michigan. Where do you think the Big Ten is in terms of tourney teams and where things sit? A lot of brackets have about six Big Ten teams getting in right now. I think there's still a lot of basketball left to be played. I think the Big Ten could definitely see seven teams and even potentially eight, depending on how Northwestern finishes out the season. But at this moment in time, Michigan, to me, could potentially be uh, definitely be a two seed, could potentially be a one seed if they went out and win the Big Ten tournament title. But 
it's just going to kind of depend on how these things go in the next couple of years. But to have six teams, and right now I think that's too little. I think there should be at least seven teams in the tournament right now from the Big Ten. Because overall, from top to bottom, the Big Ten is one of the best conferences in the country. And night in and night out, these teams are just beating each other up in these games. Yeah. And look at a team like Minnesota, who's in the bottom of the standings. They took Indiana down to the wire. They led in that game against the Hoosiers in the fourth quarter. So yeah. night in and night out, all these teams continue to get better. Better, but the bottom teams can compete with the top teams for a majority of these games. The Big Ten parity is truly unbelievable this year. I got to tell you, I have a hard time looking at Iowa and the way they're playing right now and not thinking that somehow they figure out a way to be a, a top four seed before I all mean, is said and done, right? I mean, they're, they're shooting the ball man, so good. well. Yeah, they're really good. They are really, really good. And they have the best player in the country. It helps. Yeah. And when you play with that type <laughs> of pace, that help. you know it helps? <laughs> helps me have somebody who has had five triple doubles this year. Just, yeah. just saying. But when they play with the type of pace that they play at, teams try to get out and run with them. And I don't know why, if you're not necessarily a running team. Ohio State is, so that's why that game yeah. was so good the other night. But if you're not a running team, why are you trying to run with Iowa? They're going to win that battle every time. Iowa has struggled this year when teams have successfully slowed them down. Yeah, easier said than done, though. Right? Much easier said than done. Uh, you are. You got Wisconsin, Illinois this Wisconsin, week. Wisconsin, Illinois on Sunday, All right. 2 p.m. Central. Uh, be there. Be there. Be there. <laughs> be here, as it, as it were. And with seven teams in the top 30 in the net rankings entering the weekend, Purdue the only one, as you can see, in the top 10. But all seven of those teams feel like fairly clear-cut NCAA tourney clubs at this juncture. Michigan, the other team that could perhaps make a postseason run, but clearly with a lot of work to do to make that happen. But I might be out over my skis right now. I am not a bracketologist, but I happen to have access to one. Uh, my favorite bracketologist, Mike DeCourcy, is with us. Uh, Mike, a new bracket out today. And you do. You have seven in right now from the Big Ten, right? Yeah, it's pretty. It's been holding steady at seven, and it, it, in the sense of mystery, there's not much, at least in terms of who's going to get in and who's not. It, you're right about Michigan. I felt a little bit more optimistic about that after they played the way they did against Indiana. You felt like, okay, here it is. This is this is who this team can be. This is who this team will be, and it hasn't happened regularly since. So they have a long way to go. And the Big Ten offers you the opportunity. They could have a fabulous February, and then we wouldn't have, be having much question about them making it. The other seven seem fairly stable. They're, they're, Iowa is the only one that could put itself in jeopardy. They need, to, they need to win a few more games. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about them. I have them this weekend uh, coming up against Minnesota, and I was kind of starting to compile my notes and was looking at the resume. And it's a little thin, right? I mean, they have the win over Indiana that's probably the only team that they've beaten that is clearly going to be uh, in the NCAA tourney at this point. What do you think the Hawks need to do to make that position solid? Is it like a couple more wins against clear-cut tourney teams? Yeah, and, and I think that one of the things that's to, to Iowa's advantage is that metrically they're very strong. Uh, it, it, oddly enough, uh, they're, they have a stronger uh, net rating and a stronger uh, – a stronger Ken Palm rating than Providence, which is 19 and two and leading the big East. <laughs> so they've got all that going for them, but uh, really just, they lose almost all of their most difficult games. And that's a problem for them. So when, when you look at what's coming up for them, that's where you, you, the Minnesota game is the kind of game they can't afford to lose. That, that has to be a must win for them. And it's early to be talking about must wins, but let's put it this way. If you don't get that, then you have to go out and beat somebody you're not supposed to beat, uh, like winning at Illinois, for instance, on the final day, uh, the final weekend of the regular season. Uh, interestingly, they don't have a ton of elite opponents, a, a, a lot of quad one type games left. They've got uh, a lot of the, the middle teams in the league. Uh, so they play a couple of Michigans. And we mentioned before where the circumstance that the Wolverines are in. I think if I'm Iowa, that's that's a team I'd like to sweep at this point. You had Wisconsin as a number one seed at the beginning of the week, and I know that caused a little waves in the, the bracketology world. You know, you were talking about Providence, right, and kind of the difference of how the metrics view them versus maybe how the, the brackets view them. Man, Wisconsin, to me, like, I look at their metrics, and they are just dreadful. The computers hate them. I mean, dreadful relative to, to where they are in terms of a bracket, right? I mean, they were like, they're in the 20s, I think, or 21 in the net. And 
you know, Ken Palm somewhere around there as well. Why is there such a difference? I, I mean, I look like look at who they've beaten. They have they're tied for the most quad one wins in the country. Uh, to me, that's the measure of a team. W- w- why is there such a difference here? Well, first of all, it, it, the, to amplify what you're saying, when you look at their quad one wins, there are teams that have a lot, a, a fair amount of quad one wins that are fairly easily seen through, so to speak. Uh, not not much real accomplishment there. It's 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 harder to win on the road at the number seventy team than it is uh, to say uh, to say beat the number uh, sixty team at home. But it's still not that great to have done that. Uh, and that's there are teams out there like that. That is not Wisconsin. Wisconsin's quad one wins. There there is a dividing line between the 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 first quadrant the 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 the, the the first level of victories in quadrant one and then the next level of victories. And they have a lot of the high achievement quad one wins, but the, it comes down to the predictive metrics like Ken Palm. Uh, how do you, how do you play per possession? How much do you win by? And that's not a big Wisconsin thing uh, in, in some years. And, and it's not endemic to the, to Wisconsin's program. It's this Wisconsin team. A lot of years people thought that Ken Palm's formula was almost set up to favor Wisconsin <laughs> right. because they were so yes. efficient. Yes. Uh, but this team just hasn't been, but they've been terrific. And so uh, the other thing that you have to remember is that the predictive metrics aren't the only kind. Uh, the the performance metrics, the, uh, the achievement metrics, like Kevin Palga's KPI or strength of record, uh, the, Wisconsin still scores tremendously in those because of exactly what we're talking about. What about Illinois? Uh, you have them as a five this week. And I got to tell you, I, again, I don't go through this exercise. But if I were a coach and I got my bracket and I saw that I was playing Illinois as a five seed, I would say, are you kidding me? I mean, <laughs> like, this is a team, Mike, that I look at and I think could win the national championship. And look, yes. I get it. Like, I, I get that they lost to Marquette. They lost to Cincinnati. I and mean, they played Marquette without Kofi Coburn. Uh, they played Cincinnati in Kofi's first game back. And I, I know Cincinnati is, is not a great team. Uh, is it just as simple as those games still being held against them? Isn't there some way to kind of factor in that we're talking about a team that hasn't been whole all year, essentially? Yeah, but they have to be whole and do some things. I think that's the key. And, and it's been so long since in, until this week that they've been able to be together and at full strength. And they have to now take what they have and build toward March by becoming great and also by achieving great things. I, I, I love their team and I hate bracketing them. I, it's, <laughs> it's one of the biggest pains I have every Tuesday and Friday because what do you do with them? The achievement isn't there. They're a lot like Kentucky in that one, the achievement isn't there to the level that their their ability is. And two, a lot of the reason for that is that every time they play a big game, they're hurt. Uh, in Kentucky's case, they go to Auburn, they go to LSU, and they lose guys. In Illinois' case, those guys have barely been there. So I, I, I still think that this is the team with the highest ceiling in this league, and I won't be at all surprised to see them on the, on the two-line or somewhere around there by the time we get to doing this for real. Uh, but they, they have to start stacking up those kinds of victories, the, the ones against the quad one uh, opponents that say Wisconsin already has covered. You have Purdue on the one line this week. I, I mentioned you had one Big Ten team as a one seed last week. It was Wisconsin. And now here it is as Purdue. What sets them apart? Well, in their case, you're talking about a team that has uh, a lot of quad one victories. They, what's weird is that they don't have much in the area of quad two. That's not really an important metric for me, uh, an important measuring stick for me. Uh, for it's, uh, that Quad two is for teams that are trying to get in, basically, trying mm-hmm. to get out of the first four, trying to get in the tournament. What do you do against quad one? And that's that's Purdue. They've done tremendously well in that, cir- in, in that cir- circumstance. Uh, when they've played quad one opponents, uh, they've gotten it done. And so I think we'll see, I think we'll see them fighting for a one seat all the way to the end. It, 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 it's a very difficult league and they're going to play a lot of terrific opponents. And so what, what, what do they do in those games is going to be important, but they've got great metrics. They've got a tremendous team. Uh, they're strong at, on the wing with Jaden Ivey in the post with the multiple centers. 
We're starting to see better play at point guard from Eric Hunter. He's had a really nice last four games. If he can, t- if he can, can keep that up as we get through into March, uh, they become a legitimate national championship contender. Now, you say they have great metrics, but they are 93rd in the nation in defensive efficiency. And you have, you know, for years where I've known you, you have said that, hey, there is a template for teams that win the national championship. And it involves offensive and defensive efficiency numbers. And I know that 93rd in defensive efficiency it does not qualify. So how concerned are you? Like, let's take bracketing out of it. But let's talk about them as a national championship contender. Like, let's take it on the court. How concerned are you about that, Mike? Uh, terrifically so. And uh, they have to make an, a tremendous amount of improvement in order to become a championship team. And I don't have any doubt that Matt knows that. I don't have any doubt that the, that the players on the roster know that. Uh, I, but I, it, it's not without precedent that a team that scores poorly defensively for a lot of the year makes the kind of charge at that end of the floor that's necessary to win a championship. The best example of that, 2015 uh, Duke, which around this time, uh, I, w- I would say they were probably 75 in defense in, in 2015, around this same period of time. And they went into the tournament well into the 30s. Uh, they had made a defensive change they had made a, a lineup change by putting Justice Winslow in at power forward and going small. It's possible that uh, as they get better at Purdue with Eric Hunter at playing so strongly at point guard, that perhaps that increases their defensive potency, that they become a more effective defensive team and, and they climb that ladder and gradually become more efficient. I don't have any doubt that Matt is working very hard to make them a better defensive team when I said they have great metrics, I'm talking about the overall rating. I know that that defensive number isn't what it needs to be. Uh, offense, yeah. they're at the very top of the charts, but the D's got to get better. Mike, I want to leave you with this, like in 30 seconds. Who's the most interesting team in the Big Ten from here on in, in your mind, in I, terms of bracketology? I, I think it's Indiana, uh, because they're a team that struggled on the road early. Uh, they still were learning their coaches approach and system they still were learning each other from the standpoint of uh, multiple new players in the rotation uh, Z- Xavier Johnson coming in Miller Cop, Parker Stewart none of those players was with the group last year uh, so they're all still trying to, to they, they all at the beginning of the year were all still trying to get get on the right page I think they're on that page now and they are continuing to improve and I, I really believe that over the course of this month that we'll see them continue to escalate and that I don't think they're a seven seed forever. When I look at the, when I do my brackets, there, there comes a point where it's like, I don't have any more of those. I don't have any more fours or any more fives. It, the, the teams that I have to put there don't fit. Uh, and I, I look at Indiana as a team that could fit very comfortably into those circumstances, into that, into that line on my bracket if they continue to play as they have over the last two weeks or so. Interesting. Well, huge opportunity coming up as Trey and I were talking about tomorrow against Illinois. Mike Corsi, great stuff. Really appreciate it. Thanks, my friend. Thanks, Dave.